Welcome back guys. First of all, shout out to Donut Media for including the 308 first on its list of crazy engine swaps that are getting out of hand. That's a pretty cool honor. Welcome to all the new subs. Now I know all of you guys clicked on this episode because you want to see wheels on the 308. Honestly, I do too. So we're going to start out with that by test fitting the wheels from the Model A on this thing so we can get an idea of how 18 inch wheels and tires might fit and we'll talk about why because it's pretty important. I bounced around on the 308 this weekend, got a little bit done on the hood duct, but ran out of material. We're going to scrap all the progress we made at the back of the car in the last episode and go back to the drawing board on the oil cooler plans. And we're going to make a filler neck so we can put fuel in this thing because that's pretty important to do. I've also got some new tools to show you, including the biggest, baddest tool I have ever bought, a 12-ton Arbor Press. We're going to crush some stuff with it. It should be a fun episode. Let's dive into it. Over the weekend, I finally got a lot of shop organization done, starting with all of my AN fittings, which are finally labeled and organized for future use. I also put away all of the loose parts and pieces behind the Model A, which got me a bunch of floor space back, and I cleared out the tool area to give us room for the new 12-ton Arbor Press. I found a home for everything over the weekend, including the wheels for the Model A, since they're definitely not going to be going back on anytime soon. So we've got to pull them out if we want to test fit these on the 308. As most of you guys know, we don't have any suspension on the 308 at this point in time, so we're simply going to balance them and mock them up as where they would go if we did indeed have uprights on the car. The only thing I'm trying to take a look at today is the overall diameter of these wheels, so as long as we get them positioned loosely flush with the fenders, we can assume that's where they'd be with the final suspension setup. The reason I want to see this is because for the track wheel and tire setup, we've got to run 18 inch wheels. Whoa, stop, don't type it. I know you're gonna say, why are you spending all of this time and effort on those other wheels if they're 17s and you have to run 18s in competition? Wait till the end, we'll talk about it. I don't wanna bore everybody else with wheel nerd talk right now, but wheel nerds hang out. We're gonna discuss all this stuff at the end of the episode, but let's pay attention to these right now. After taking a bunch of measurements off camera, the good news is that the overall diameter of the 18 inch tires will run is only about a quarter of an inch bigger than the 17 inch setup. So the difference is pretty negligible and I don't have to worry about how these will clear the bodywork or have to worry about blowing up a fender, which is my main concern. On the other hand, I do have a couple of concerns about the overall ride height of the car. The road surface of the tire is quite a bit below the bottom of the car itself, but we do have to add aero underneath the body and the front end of this thing. And there's a diffuser that'll be out back, and I have a feeling this will take up quite a bit of the space between the car and the ground. For now, most of this stuff is just guesswork, but I am happy with the information I'm getting from this, and the experiment does look pretty cool to boot. Now, onto the hood vent. Way back in October, we mocked up this hood vent design with cardboard and made some really nice fitting templates for future use with aluminum. I've been putting this project off because I know it's going to be a hugely challenging one in order to get this thing to turn out the way that I would like it to. I want it to look factory, as opposed to some aftermarket add-on or aftermarket hood. But the time has finally come and I think we need to build this thing. It's one of the biggest projects still remaining that is within our control at the moment. So I bought some sheet aluminum and spent considerable time tracing our templates out. After all, we did spend a lot of time making sure those templates fit the car well, so as long as we follow those templates closely, we should have parts that fit without too much effort. I had to get crafty with how to cut these parts on the bandsaw because even though the bandsaw is massive, they were just a slight bit too large for the throat. So I actually had to trace the templates on both sides of the material, and it's the first time I've had to do that. But thankfully it did work and everything still lined up by the time I finished the project. The only tricky, non-straightforward part of building these pieces is the curvature at each end of the panel. The hole that we cut in the hood has rounded corners, and I want these panels to mate up to those corners seamlessly. To accomplish that, I actually took each panel and bent it carefully around the saw blade that I used to cut each corner whole. This would make sure that the diameter of each piece was correct to mate to its corner, and it worked really well. Because this entire duct is going to be welded to the hood, I have to make sure that the fit up of the parts is as good as possible, because you can't weld too much of a gap when it comes to aluminum. And I do want the fit and finish of this thing to be as OEM as possible. We've only got two panels left to make at this point, the front and the back, and the fit up of our sides is looking pretty good. 
Our curved corners all line up with the panel really nicely. I'm actually quite surprised. And all these parts fit up like you see here with just a little bit of tape holding them into place, which is a really good sign once we go to weld this thing. I would press forward and keep focusing on this project as it's going really well, but I ran out of material big enough to actually do the rear piece, and that's what comes next. It looks like I'm going to need to go get a full sheet in order to have a piece big enough to pull it off, so we'll save that one for later this week or next. Up next on the list is building a filler neck for the fuel cell. This is one of my favorite design aspects of the 308, or at least small details. The filler neck is hidden behind this mesh. It actually opens up, and here you'd have the factory gas cap. Now, I lost it because who knows why. So we need to add a new cap and a tube that goes from this hole down to the taped up filler neck on the fuel tank down there. It should be a pretty simple project, hopefully just a couple of bends. So let's get out some two inch aluminum tubing and start sticking some stuff together. This project was actually quite tough to document because the camera just won't fit into one of the most cramped areas of the entire build so far. But most of it just consists of cutting, fitting, cutting, and fitting, slowly trying to get the pipe to point exactly where you want it to go. Each end of the pipe has a specific location that it needs to land, and we've got a few obstacles to dodge on the way. But eventually, I wound up with this, which gets us pretty much all the way there. We need a coupler in order to attach this to the fuel cell, so I'm showing you my favorite trick for cutting really nice coupler edges. By no means am I suggesting that this is safe or the right way to do it, but if you have a lathe, I haven't found a better way yet. It's the only way I've found to cut couplers without having weird frayed edges or uneven corners, and it gives you a part that looks like it came off the shelf. And finally, we need a gas cap, so I'm using this vibrant billet cap and threaded bung, which should be a nice simple solution. Everything needs to be tacked or welded together, so I'm going to start the project out by doing this one because it's the only weld that should be completely invisible once the entire thing is installed in the car. First piece welded. I think I let aluminum scare me a little bit more than it should. I'm actually super stoked with how this turned out. It's far from perfect, but honestly, I'm quite happy with that. It looks really good. There's really only like the start stop that isn't exactly what I'd want, but that's sweet. Will the rest of it go this well? No chance, but it's clear that all of that take practice on that front subframe for the Model A is definitely helping. And I feel like I'm getting better again. I know this isn't great by any measure, but I haven't welded very much aluminum and I am, uh, I'll call it satisfactory. I'm not ashamed of it, and that's a pretty good start. I moved on to simply tacking the rest of the filler neck together, just in case any of it needs to be cut apart because it moves around or I got anything incorrect as I taped it together. After all, tape isn't all that reliable. I did find that, as everybody always says, it's important to clean the aluminum as much as possible. The more time I spent cleaning, the better my tacks came out. And some of them honestly came out pretty good. With the whole thing in one piece, it was time to fit it to the car. And I'm happy to say, it lined up really well. All right guys, it needs one small adjustment, but we've got a filler cap and neck, and all of that routed down to the fuel cell with our aluminum tubing. And it's all just tack welded together right now. I'd love to fully weld it, but I don't actually have time to get that done today. So that's tomorrow's project. But I think it turned out pretty well. And one other cool little touch, is I managed to retain this guy. The paint protector for the gas pump. And this one's not the original one, so I'll probably remake this, maybe out of like leather or something cool, but pretty cool little touch. Doesn't have to stay on there if we don't want it to, but I like it nonetheless. In all, I'm really happy with how this turned out. And I'm really happy that I got to keep the 308's hidden filler neck. Sure, a dry break would have been cool, but I like this a bit more. All right, oil cooler. I know at this point we've had two full episodes on it. I'm only gonna talk about it for a quick second. All of the progress we've made, all the discussions about how to duck this thing, how to plumb it, all that stuff, we're throwing it out the window. 
I'm not even gonna run an oil cooler. My buddy Amir, who has a Turbo K20 NSX, who competes in Global Time Attack, called me up after watching the last episode and he said, hey, why? Why run it at all? And I figured it was pretty necessary, but he let me know that uh, according to all of his data logs, the highest his oil temp has ever gotten in his car is 240 degrees. Now, that is in and of itself pretty non-concerning, but I've also got two to three times the amount of oil capacity he does. So, honestly, I'm gonna eliminate a point of failure and eliminate a lot of weight and not run it. We will have all the data logging we need with that Haltech ECU, and if we see oil temps getting hotter than we want, we can always add it but why add unnecessary complications and a potential point of failure or leakage when we don't need it? So, oil cooler, hasta la vista. Last week, I took delivery of the biggest, most expensive, and heaviest tool I have ever purchased. But it's also one that I've been waiting a long time for the chance to own. This is, by every measure, a dream tool. Hidden underneath this wrapping is a Dake Model 401A 12-ton Arbor Press. And if you don't know what that is, I'll show you how it works here in just a moment. But for starters, a bit of background. This thing is an American-made, all-cast iron tool, and it's one of those that's absolutely going to outlive me, no question about it. In fact, it's already quite a bit older than I am, which is why it's got quite a bit of dirt and grime on it. It's been used in a factory for most of its life, so I want to get it cleaned up with some Turtle Wax Bug and Tar Remover and see if we can give this thing a little bit of a shine. It's definitely not perfect, and there is a lot of decades old dirt on this thing, but I'm happy that it's cleaning up to some degree, and I'll get it dirty on my own terms. Now before we actually use this thing, I think it's probably best we get it off of the pallet and positioned in its final resting place. This free gantry came in handy once again, allowing us to move this thing without too much effort, and I have no idea how I would have done it without it. The cracked concrete floor meant we had to shim the base of this thing, but otherwise, it's set up and it's ready to roll. So let me show you what it is and how it works. To put it simply, it's just a press. It is a giant ratcheting press. You pull the handle and the ram goes down and anything underneath gets crushed. There is a wheel on the side so that you can freely control the ram independently of the handle itself, which gives you really fine and simple control. But overall, that's about all there is to it. It's got two different speeds, which allows for really simple and fine control so that you can provide very light forces or extreme pressing force, up to 24,000 pounds which does sound like a lot, and it is enough to bend a half inch of steel without much input effort. But it's not gonna flatten things entirely like the hydraulic press channel. It requires a lot of force to do that. But the 24,000 pounds we have here is definitely enough to bend about three quarters of an inch of material without too much work and just as easily flatten it back out. The high positioned handle on the Arbor Press allows you to simply just hang your body weight on it and only takes about 100 pounds of force to get everything out of this 12 ton Arbor Press. Now of course it's great for doing anything that a press can do like installing bushings or pressing parts out, but it's also really good for bending and unbending metal parts. It's great for making tabs and brackets, and when you overbend one, this is about as perfect of a tool as it gets if you want to flatten it back out. And best of all, there's no dealing with having to pump a hydraulic jack a thousand times. But let's be real, I know you guys just want to see me crush some stuff with it. So first on the chopping block is this little die cast model Land Cruiser. Say bye bye. Start it up.
And one more for good measure, why not crush my old iPod Classic? Now I said this is never going to match the fun of anything the Hydraulic Press Channel has to offer, but it's still at least a little bit satisfying to watch. And that's not the only new tool that I have to show off for this episode. I also bought this 20 inch Apex disc sander, and it's supposed to be the baddest of all disc sanders ever made. It has a two horsepower, three phase electric motor on it, and it's built entirely of cast iron, and the entire assembly weighs somewhere around 400 pounds. Now I got this one pretty cheap because it is in a lot of pieces, but I've already figured out how most of it goes back together everything but the spring assembly that goes inside of the column in order to help raise and lower the sanding deck. Now the only problem is that the motor on this thing has a bent output shaft, and it's really bent. But the motor's a lot more easily replaced than the sanding surface itself, and I've found a lot of different replacement motors, so I've just gotta make a decision. But I'm really excited to get this tool back in action. All right, we're at the end of the episode and I try to save my just big blabbering talks for the end so that people that aren't interested can skip it. So from here, we're talking wheels. Wheel nerds, this one's for you. Let's go back to the question a moment ago about why I'm running 18s in competition, why I'm not putting any emphasis on that right now, so on and so forth. We're gonna have to talk through this for a moment here. Available tire sizes in the spec tire for the class this car would be in, which is the Yokohama AO52, there's like nothing in 17. They don't really cater to it. In order to have a tire that fits well, we have to run an 18, so we need an 18 inch track wheel and tire setup. Now, plenty of you are gonna say, why not then set the car up for 18s? What are you doing? Well, the diameter between 17s and 18s for the 17 inch nittos that I want to run uh, for pretty much any other purpose, track days, street, what have you, and those 18 inch spec tires are, the overall diameter is really, really close. We'll be using the same widths. So the actual effective difference between those two in the setup of the car is negligible. I'm not worried about it. I want the car to be on 17s. I'm building my dream car here, and ultimately it's supposed to be a street car that I will use in time attack. And I've already said, I don't expect this car to be competitive. It's not going to be, I'm not developing the chassis enough to do that. I'm just building something I'm really passionate about and I'm excited about. And part of that excitement comes down to the way the car will look. And I want it to be on 17s on these classic Japanese wheels that I'm building. And Everything else for me is gonna come second to that with respect to uh, the 18s and having to pick an 18 inch setup. I don't wanna just set the car on 18s because that would be better for a competition use when I won't like the way that it looks pretty much most of the time when it's not in competition. So that's the logic there. Now, this kind of is on the same note, but a lot of you guys asked, why am I putting you know these crazy custom wheels that are custom spec and all that stuff on this car if I could have a problem, bend one, break one, go off track, and be screwed and have to wait for custom wheels instead of using something off of the shelf. Well, the answer is we've got to think a few more steps forward than that. We're building to a custom set of wheels to make sure that these custom wheels fit. And then any wheels we get after the fact, we can just match the specs of them. It's not something beyond uh, our control. We just don't know exactly what the ones we've ordered will show up as because I don't want to bet that they're going to nail it. We're taking an old set of wheels, cutting them apart, and having custom halves made, and trying to get the offset right, but I have a feeling there's gonna be a little bit of leeway in there, and I want, once they arrive, to fit everything correctly, and then we can just measure those wheels, and anything we run in the future, whether it's other street wheels, track wheels, backups, what have you, can just be built to match those, or we can find an offset the shelf solution that is very close, and we just use some spacers to get it perfect. Not a big deal. That's my wheel nerd talk for you. Hopefully that answers most of the questions, I'm sure there'll be plenty, so leave them in the comments. I promise I've thought all of this stuff out. The wheels are like the most important part of the whole car to me. Uh, I think wheels matter immeasurably in how the overall car will look and feel and how it tells its story, how it's portrayed. I want those 17s on the car and then we'll put an 18 on it when it's gotta hit the track. No big deal to me. 
On that note, guys, this episode's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, as always, for the support. Please subscribe if you haven't yet. It helps me out. Leave a comment, leave a like. You know, we got to beat that algorithm somehow. I'll catch you guys at the end of the week. Sorry this episode was late. Next one will be on time. I'll see you then.